Ozendowski, Beasts, Men and Gods, 27, Mystery in a Small Temple. Prince Chultan Bailey and I were ready to leave Narabanchi Kure. While the Hutuktu was holding service for the Sait in the Temple of Blessing, I wandered around through the narrow alleyways between the walls of the houses of the various grades of Lama Gelongs, Gettles, Cheji, and Rabd Jampa, of schools where the learned doctors of theology or Maramba taught together with the doctors of medicine or Talama, of the residences for students called Bandi, of stores, archives, and libraries. When I returned to the yurta of the Hutuktu, he was inside. He presented me with a large hatik and proposed a walk around the monastery. His face wore a preoccupied expression from which I gathered that he had something he wished to discuss with me. As we went out of the yurta, the liberated president of the Russian Chamber of Commerce and a Russian officer joined us. The Hutuktu led us to a small building just back of a bright yellow stone wall. In that building once stopped the Dalai Lama and Bogdo Khan, and we always paint the buildings yellow where these holy persons have lived. Enter. The interior of the building was arranged with splendor. On the ground floor was the dining room, furnished with richly carved, heavy blackwood Chinese tables and cabinets filled with porcelains and bronze. Above were two rooms, the first a bedroom hung with heavy yellow silk curtains, a large Chinese lantern richly set with coloured stones, hung by a thin bronze chain from the carved wooden ceiling beam. Here stood a large square bed covered with silken pillows, mattresses and blankets. The framework of the bed was also of the Chinese blackwood and carried especially on the posts that held the roof-like canopy, finely executed carvings with the chief motive, the conventional dragon devouring the sun. By the side stood a chest of drawers completely covered with carvings, setting forth religious pictures. Four comfortable easy chairs completed the furniture, save for the low oriental throne, which stood on a dais at the end of the room. Do you see this throne? said the Hutuktu to me. One night in winter, Several horsemen rode into the monastery and demanded that all the Gelongs and Getuls with Hutuktu and Kampo at their head should congregate in this room. Then one of the strangers mounted the throne where he took off his baslik or cap-like head covering. All of the Lamas fell to their knees as they recognized the man who had been long ago described in the sacred bulls of Dalai Lama, Tashi Lama and Bogdo Khan. He was the man to whom the whole world belongs and who has penetrated into all the mysteries of nature. He pronounced a short Tibetan prayer, blessed all his hearers and afterwards made predictions for the coming half century. This was 30 years ago and in the interim all his prophecies are being fulfilled. During his prayers before that small shrine in the next room, this door opened of its own accord. The candles and lights before the altar lighted themselves, and the sacred braziers without coal gave forth great streams of incense that filled the room. And then without warning, the king of the world and his companions disappeared from among us. Behind him remained no trace save the folds in the silken throne 
coverings which smoothed themselves out and left the throne as though no one had sat upon it. The Hutuktu entered the shrine, kneeled down, covering his eyes with his hands and began to pray. I looked at the calm, indifferent face of the golden Buddha, over which the flickering lamps threw changing shadows, and then turned my eyes to the side of the throne. It was wonderful and difficult to believe, but I really saw there the strong, muscular figure of a man with a swarthy face of stern and fixed expression about the mouth and jaws, thrown into high relief by the brightness of the eyes. Through his transparent body draped in white raiment, I saw the Tibetan inscriptions on the back of the throne. I closed my eyes and opened them again. No one was there, but the silk throne covering seemed to be moving. Nervousness, I thought. Abnormal, abnormal and overemphasized impressionability growing out of the unusual surroundings and straits. The Hutuktu turned to me and said, Give me your hatik. I have the feeling that you are troubled about those whom you love, and I want to pray for them. And you must pray also, importune God, and direct the sight of your soul to the King of the world, who was here and sanctified this place. The Hutuktu placed the hatik on the shoulder of the Buddha, and prostrating himself on the carpet before the altar, whispered the words of prayer. Then he raised his head and beckoned me to him with a slight movement of his hand. Look at the dark space behind the statue of Buddha and he will show your beloved to you. Readily obeying his deep voice command, I began to look into the dark niche behind the figure of the Buddha. Soon out of the darkness began to appear streams of smoke or transparent threads. They floated in the air, becoming more and more dense and increasing in number until gradually they formed the bodies of several persons and the outlines of various objects. I saw a room that was strange to me with my family there, surrounded by some whom I knew and others whom I did not. I recognized even the dress my wife wore. Every line of her dear face was clearly visible. Gradually the vision became too dark, dissipated itself into the streams of smoke and transparent threads and disappeared. Behind the golden Buddha was nothing but the darkness. The Hutuktu arose, took my hatik from the shoulder of the Buddha and handed it to me with these words. Fortune is always with you and with your family. God's goodness will not forsake you. We left the building of this unknown king of the world, where he had prayed for all mankind and had predicted the fate of peoples and states. I was greatly astonished to find that my companions had also seen my vision and to hear them describe to me in minute detail the appearance and the clothes of the persons whom I had seen in the dark niche behind the head of Buddha. In order that I might have the evidence of others on this extraordinary impressive vision, I asked them to make protocols or affidavits concerning what they saw. This they did and I now have these statements in my possession. The Mongol officer also told me that Chultun Bailey had that day before asked the Hutuktu to reveal to him his fate in this important juncture of his life and in this crisis of his country, but the Hutuktu only waved his hand in an expression of fear and refused. When I asked the Hutuktu for the reason of his refusal, suggesting to him that it might calm and help Chultun Bailey, as the vision of my beloved had strengthened me, the Hutuktu knitted his brow and answered, No. The vision would not please the prince, 
His fate is black. Yesterday I thrice sought his fortune on the burned shoulder blades and with the entrails of cheap, and each time came to the same dire result, the same dire result. He did not really finish speaking, but covered his face with his hands in fear. He was convinced that the lot of Chilton Bailey was black as the night. In an hour we were behind the low hills that hid Narabanshi Kure from our sight.